Hey, how are you? Uh, I think everyone is uh, fine, uh, and, uh, very safe, and uh, I'm very happy to see you. Long time no see. So we have uh, this is uh, the class connect through the uh, webinar the shoulder. We have uh, our learning time will be uh, one hour the thirty minutes. Okay, can you hear me? Jiang. Very much. Very good. Nice to see you, Professor Lee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. And uh, Dr. Sunjay from India. Good. Yes. I yeah. Can. Thank you. And the Professor uh, Wei Ran Su. Wei Ran Su. He, he is not here. What about the Taiwan? And uh, Bancha from Thailand. Oh, good. So uh, thank you for uh, joining this uh, webinar meeting. The shoulder. We have uh, three sessions, uh, and uh, the one is uh, the first moderator is me, and the first presenter is uh, Chen Yang uh, Jiang. The second session. Uh, moderator will be a uh, bunch of from Thailand and the uh, two speech and uh, the last one is uh, Dr. Jiang and we will finish around uh, the 6.30 and um, please uh, don't hesitate to ask a question uh, anytime during our presentation and uh, we will try to answer the question when we can even uh, the, during the talk. So uh, the, I invite the Chen Yang Jiang, uh, double poorly tackling for the arthroscope fixation of bulky bony bankrupt lesion to five years of follow with the uh, CT evaluation. So uh, Jiang, you first. Can you, can you see my desktop now? Yeah. All right, so let's begin. First of all, I uh, wish everybody for this webinar that you are safe and sound during this COVID-19 crisis. And it's uh, really a good chance for us to get together to have this kind of a discussion among shoulder surgeons. So, okay. So uh, today I want to talk about some of my case series about a double pulley technique for a special type of bony bank card. That's the bony, uh, bulky bony bank card reconstruction. Uh, we gotta know that um, uh, broadly speaking, bony bank card means there is a defect or a, a, a bony fragment remain uh, from the anterior rim of the glenoid. But uh, strictly speaking, when we talk about bony bank card, we're talking about the fragments. So uh, this is very uh, common according to Sugaya's uh, publication and also according to our own experiences that uh, in the TUBS, in the instability patients, a bony bank is pretty common in our uh, pathology in our patients. And most of them are not big enough. So we can do uh, pretty easy with a astroscopic uh, bony bank recon just with uh, like a soft tissue bank recon uh, using suture anchors to go through it. The key is that because some of sometimes the bony bank card lesion will hinder you to, to see the, the tips of your suture hook. So sometimes you have to, to have your subtle sutures uh, go into the uh, subscapularis uh, muscle fibers, then you find it. And another point is that when you tie any note from the anchor, you, you, you got to leave at least one uh, subtle sutures in in order to pass the next suture from the suture anchor. So, so this is uh, a uh, normal or regular bony bank card. We can have a very good reconstruction. And uh, the, uh, the healing rate is usually very high. And uh, the clinical outcome can be expected and uh, to be a very satisfactory one. So this is the, uh, the case that we just show. That one year post up, you can see the remodeling of the, uh, the glenoid almost to the native you know, uh, morphologies. But in some cases, whatever in fresh cases or in, in some kind of a chronic cases, there'll be a fracture like this. 
It was a very bulky bony banker with a very wide base. So theoretically, and also in, 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 the liter in clinical practice, if you use just the, uh, the same way that we did for banker repair with one sutra anchors in, then this wide base may cause toggling or instability of our fixations. So uh, back in 2011, about nine years ago, we had published our uh, uh, surgical technique in the KSSTA uh, describing a double pulley dural technique to use um, uh, the double row sutra anchors using a double pulley technique uh, to achieve a good fixation, a double row fixation for these bulky fragments uh, of the bony banker. So our indication for, uh, for the technique is, is either to be a chronic bony banker in the TUBS or acute bony banker fragments with a displacement more than five millimeters in a fresh case. And then both of these two circumstances, you have a bulky fragment with the maximum width of the base of the fragment more than five millimeters. That's our indication. So this is our case series. Uh, we included um, TOBS with bony banker lesion and acute uh, uh, glenoid uh, fresh fractures and uh, treated by this uh, double pulley technique. And we are very strict about the uh, evaluations. So we need uh, three complete set of uh, radio CT evaluations, including a 3D reconstruction at pre-op, immediate post-op, and post-op one year. And also the patient had to be available for the clinical evaluation for at least two years. Hey, uh, Dr. Chia. The MDI patients, the private Hello. surgery, or we have fixations in addition to anchors, like we have screws or button or anything. So this is only about a case theory uh, about a, a bisutural anchors with a double pulley technique. So this is our series. In about three years uh, period, we have identified 122 bony bank card patients and 34 are using this uh, double pulley technique. Finally, uh, according to our inclusion criteria, 25 was in, were enrolled in the study. The mean age is 44, and uh, 19 of them is acute cases. Six of them are recurrent uh, instabilities. And the mean follow-up is uh, 3.4 years, is a two to five years follow-up. And the evaluation divided into clinical one and a radiological one. For clinical evaluations, the, the patient will be followed regularly at three weeks, three months, uh, six weeks, three months, six months, one year and every year then thereafter. And that post-op one year, there will be a CT with 3D reconstruction together with the uh, immediate post-op. And the final final follow-up for clinical evaluations, we use ASVS, VES, and range of motion uh, to document the uh, clinical uh, outcomes. For radiological evaluation, we use X-rays as a final follow-up uh, to do the Samuelson Pietro classification to see the osteoarthritis. And we judged healing and reduction quality according to SCIA on the axial CT cut. And we use CD on face view to evaluate the glenoid size, fragment size, and the reconstruction size, and also at the final follow up like this. So, this is the fresh one that will, uh, will, uh, will ca calculate the, the native glenoid and the, uh, the, the fragment size. And at the end of the uh, a one-year CT and the immediate post-op uh, post CT, we also evaluated the added up and reconstructed the uh, glenoid size. And for the evaluation, uh, we did a little bit uh, uh, kind of a research on the reliability. We have one independent observer have three times within three months, always in two months, uh, interval average, uh, to do the, uh, to the evaluation of the, uh, the glenoid. And uh, we found that the uh, ICC is, is very good or about uh, like 0.9, 90%. So this excellent uh, reliability and uh, uh, with intra-observer, intra-observer reliability. So this is one of the typical cases here. And uh, this is a bony back, it's a fresh fracture and the patient dislocated the three times within a week. Although every time they, they relocate, but you can see the fragment is behind the joint here. So it's not stable for the patient. CT scan showing here, there's the two major fragments. You can see the base of the, 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 the fragment bed is uh, very, very wide. And the CT, 3D CT scan on the right, you can see there's a white base here. So this is the, uh, uh, the interrupt video here. Usually there were some, uh, you know, although it's not a free body here, it's some, some, have some connection 
with the labrums here. And this uh, is pretty easy because it's an oblique bone bed here. So you can use the anterior inferior portal to do the double row fixation with just one portal. I mean, one, in, one anterior inferior portal. I'll show a case just in about two minutes that you need an additional portal. So the double pulley technique is that you pass all your four sutures only one time, at, once a time to, through the anterior capsule. Then you do the reduction. You can see that there's still some kind of a connection with the labrum posteriorly. And then we should put this part, part, uh, th this part in the upper side to squeeze this in. So this is what we consider the median row of the double pulley. Now we go to the uh, margin of articular surface to the lateral row to do the double pulley technique. And the beautiful thing of this double pulley technique is that you can traction on this kind of the pulley sutures and move all the knot away from the, um, the articular surface. And also by tensioning this uh, double, uh, the, uh, double pulley loop, you're aiding the, the reduction of your fragments here. So this is another one. So with this double pulley techniques, you can see this is very stable fixations and even better uh, stability than the uh, screws or anything other else. And the patient can start a uh, post-op rehab pretty fast after the surgery. So this is the pre-op x-ray. And this is the post-op x-ray. At that time, I'm using metal anchors, double row metal anchors. Pre-op axial view, double view, post-op view. And this is pre-op CT and 3D recon and post-op 3. You can see it's almost an anatomical reduction with the, uh, the reconstruction of the whole uh, glenoid here. And as I said, if you've got an oblique bone bed, you can do the anterior uh, two roll of uh, anchors to, in just one cannula. But what if you have a very vertical one, like a like cliff sign here, very vertical one. Then you need a uh, aiding additional anterior inferior transubscapularis portal like this. This is anterior inferior portal. And now I'm, I'm marking this. This is the anterior, more inferior is the trans uh, sub, subscapular portal because only with this direction, you can get, you know, you can get to the, uh, uh, the neck of the glenoid in the right angle. And otherwise with using this cannula, you cannot get your screw in or anchor in for the median roll here. So I, I'll pass, uh, fast forward a little bit. And the same thing here, also, there's another technical demanding thing about this bony, uh, bulky fragment is that when you're using the suture hooks, the passing your sutures, most of the time you cannot see the end of your suture hook. So you have to pass all your sutures into the uh, space in the, uh, in the subscapular muscle fibers. Then later on, you go into the fiber, you find your end on the other end and take it out. So some, this is the routine when you do a very bulky uh, bony back bank heart uh, fragment when you want to do arthroscopic reconstruction. And this is another of the, the most inferior uh, stitches that will not go through the fragment, but will lift up the anterior inferior capsule to uh, diminish or minimize the, the, uh, the, the axillary pouch to get a, a very good tension. So I'll fast forward for this and everything is the same here. And also by this double pulley technique, you can see they are aiding the reduction here by tensioning and aiding with the, uh, the, the, the hook or any instrument when you tighten up. So along with the st stabilization, they also aiding for the reconstruction like this. And by pulling the suture loop that you tied outside the, the, the body, and then you can pull away from all the knot away from the cartilage to avoid the cartilage damage of the humor head. So this is the result. We have 25 uh, patients enrolled. And um, the follow-up, as I said, is uh, average about three years. And, and the final follow-up, no risk of dislocation or instability was identified. ASES score is pretty good and very minimal pain. And the radio motion recovery is pretty satisfactory. For radiological uh, assessment, all fragment healed. Uh, that was uh, really a, a good uh, a good uh, uh, outcome. The reduction quality, I would say 86% uh, of the patients have achieved a good and excellent uh, reduction quality. You can see for the 25 patients here, 
Only four, they have fair reduction according to Skaya's uh, classification. And all the others, they have excellent and good reduction. And interestingly, unlike the coracoid transfer, for a bony bank card repair, there's very minimal resorption happened here. So this is very interesting. It's doing nothing like the Bristol or Lauder J. And uh, for quite of the patients, some of them are even bigger at the, at the one year post op than the immediate post op. And this is also interesting finding was also reported by Sugaya on the JBGS a couple of years ago. And his finding is that the final follow up with the uh, uh, glenoid um, reconstructed side is even a little bit bigger than the immediate post op. So this is a really interesting thing. The, uh, the other issues regarding this double pulley technique is about you have sutures exposed at the uh, articular surfaces. So theoretically, it might have a, a very little chance to have the abrasion of the humor head uh, cartilage to cause cartilage damage, and then you have arthritis in the long run. So uh, we have at the final follow-up, we take the x-rays and doing the Samuelson PS12 classification. And the result is pretty promising. It's only one patient with a concomitant retentive cup tear have uh, developed from grade one to two. And there is no significance between uh, the immediate post-op and the final, final follow-up uh, x-rays. But I have to say, this is a early to midterm follow-up. It's two to five years. The average only is 3.5 years. So uh, we may need a long-term follow-up to judge whether this damage or causing arthritis would be in the long run. So in conclusion, I think this double pulley bony banker technique, a reconstruction technique, is a very reliable and safe technique for bulky bony banker lesions. That is, that is to say, you have a very wide base with the bony banker fragment. And by this technique, for aiding the reduction and also a very sound fixation by this double roll technique, you can achieve very high healing rate and a very high good reduction rate. And also from our two to five years uh, clinical outcomes, uh, the result is very satisfactory. And in this early stage, we could say no evidence for cartilage damage at two to five years. But as I said, maybe we need a longer to follow up to see whether these sutures would cause any problem with the cartilages. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chen. There's a, some, uh, the, the question, you had a very good, nice uh, demonstration, especially the arc fracture. So uh, I'm wondering the size of a fragment. If we have a huge fragment, uh, it, it is not easy to hold and then penetrate the bone or even you pass through the soft tissue capsule, but uh, it's not easy. So we used to use uh, the screw fixation. So even your techniques are pretty good. I think there's some limitation of the size. The, the second is uh, time from injury to surgery. So for example, the three months later, not easy to uh, release a whole the, the fiber tissue. So please let me know uh, this uh, limitation of the size, limitation of the time. Thank you for the question, Dr. Lee. Uh, for your first question, uh, I cannot agree with you. Uh, usually the bony bank card did not uh, involve a big portion, let's say, less than 30%, less, uh, one third of the fragment. Yeah. If you have yeah. one third of your anterior glenoid is off, that is not a bony bank card. That's a glenoid fracture. That's another yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. What, I'm talking about, what I'm not talking about is a bony bank card. Usually they account only for uh, at most about less than one third or be below uh, 30%. For these kind of fractures, uh, when I, I use screw, I use an open reduction internal fixation with screws. Sometimes the screws can make a iatrogenic fracture of the fragment and make that fragment even more difficult to fix. So, so what, is your, what, what is your definition? The bony bankrupt lesion and the granoid fracture. 30%? Okay. That was it. 30%. Yeah. More, more than 30%, we will say the granule fracture. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because if you got a really bulky one, then you need a, a screw fixation for your, for your, your, your fragment. But usually, it accounts only below one third of the whole glenoid. Then, 
when you use screws, you can even further down to cause convolution by the drilling and tightening of the screws. That's number one. Number two, as I showed the first case, a lot of bony bankers have not only one fragment. So although you have a big defect with fragment, it can be two fragment or even three fragment. And that prohibitive, at least in my experience, is very difficult to fix with screws. Yeah. So I've tried that a couple of years ago and I found my difficulties. Then I'm trying to use this kind of a super anchor technique. And you know, believe me or not, after the double row fixation, you can use the probe to test the stability is unbelievably stable. And I have no problem with this patient with early pass range of motions than with screws. So that's why I think this is a, a very good technique for that. And I'm sorry, what's your second question, Professor Lee? Yeah, time said, uh, from, from the injury to the operation. Oh, yeah, right, exactly. For fresh fractures, it's okay, no problem. It is very true because about six of our patients, about 20% of my patient is an old one. It's a bony banker with a malunion of the fragment into the glenoid neck. These are instability patients. So, releasing this fragment is very critical if I do this because you have to do very, cri uh, very critical and meticulous releasing. Sometimes I use a curved acetone. Sometimes I use the liberator from the comet, the, the mm -hmm. liber liberated mm -hmm. knife. So I, you have to follow the line of the malunion to go down and you have to free up a very complete fragment of the bony banker. Otherwise, you give you hell to fixing that common of the fragment. That's number one. Number two, your release is not stop when you just get the fragment away from the glenoid neck. You have to go deeper inside, as we did the bony bank card, to get the fragment more laterally. You can see the fresh red fibers, uh, muscle fiber of subscapularis. Because when you're passing your suture hook, sometimes, most of the time, you cannot see the tip of the hook. You have to pass the shadow sutures into the muscle fiber, and then you go in again to find it. That means the release of an anterior bony bank heart lesion is critical. Not only get the bone away from the glenoid, but even further to get the fragments even laterally to expose the muscle fiber of the subscapularis. That's a very critical t surgical technique okay. when okay. you're doing such kind of surgery. Yeah. So the, the one is uh, from the audience question, why are you using the metal anchor? So it's, uh, his question is, uh, observable anchor or a pig will be better than the metal anchor? He worry about the uh, metal irritation. Metal irritation? No. I mean, firstly, uh, I mean... So, for, why for example, why it's acute, 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 acute to the injury, uh, the bony bank the reason we worry about uh, the weakness of the bone, so you choose a metal anchor instead of uh, all suture type or the observable uh, anchors? No. So it's economic reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a very early case. Mm -hmm. I'm now using a lot of peak and it's not. So, so uh, it's even the it's only my early case. Yeah, even the time limitation, hey, Ban Chao or uh, Su. The the question, Sanjay. Yeah. 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 Sanjay. Yeah. I, I, okay. Uh, it, when we get these bank art legions, uh, bony bank art legions, uh, which are relatively older, and you release them, then it at the time it becomes very difficult to control the uh, that fragment to its original bed. Uh, I have done very few cases uh, after discussion with Sugeya uh, in the past and uh, what we do, we try to reduce it to the bed and just fix it with a very thin K wire after passing the medial uh, anchors. We do a, a double row type of a fixation and a double pulley technique as you demonstrated very nicely. Uh, the same technique we use, we put anchor on the middle side. We reduce the fragment to its uh, bed, fix it with a thin K wire, and then we pass the, uh, the other anchor or the uh, anchor on the glenoid face, and then we try to uh, uh, tie the suture, and then we remove the K wire. 
So that uh, uh, eliminates a lot of hassle which we got uh, because we have very limited experience in that, very small number of cases. But that that's one thing which we found uh, was quite helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. So, so guy, I, have a very few, I think it's a question. Is that a question? I mean, I just want a very short comment. So, guy, I have a very good technique on that, of course. I, yeah. I also try sometimes to fix it. But my technique is different because Sugaya have that bone stitcher. Well, by the way, it's not combat. I'm kidding. He got a bone right. stitcher, he passed sutures through the bone. Yeah. I never do that. I pass my suture around the fragment. Okay? I, so that means yeah. I cannot fix the fragment first. I have to yeah. pass it around. So yeah. I agree it's, it's pretty tricky when you're not fixing it to do the reduction. But I'm telling you, with a double suture, with a double pulley technique, when the tight suture was aiding some of your instrument there, they can aid for reduction. So it's two ways. So Suga's way is beautiful, but he got his own instrument. So if I you, if I want to do my thing, I cannot do that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I, we have to finish the first session because the time limitation did. Now is uh, Korean time is five thirty, so the first session is a little bit delayed. Okay, so, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chiang. We will move to the second session. Moderator will be uh, uh, Dr. Bancha. So, Bancha? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. So, the next, next topic will be the surgery of the acute AC ligament rupture, arthroscopic technique uh, by Dr. Sanjay. Right? You ready? Yeah. Okay, please. Acute AC ligament rupture. Actually, uh, my my topic was just uh, totally focused on the internal bracing concept and uh, how you do internal bracing when you are talking about uh, these uh, AC ligament injuries. Actually, if you see the AC joint, it is. It has been a controversial joint for years and everybody has its own way of managing these uh, AC joint injuries. And uh, these are my disclosures, nothing to do with this presentation. Uh, what I'm talking about, there's no confusion as far as treatment of these two type 1 and type 2 fractures are concerned, type 2 dislocations are concerned, and there's no confusion as far as type 6 is concerned. We are concerned about the type 3, 4 and 5 injuries and that too in a moderately active young patients who don't do too much of uh, heavy demand activity on the shoulder. So these are my indication for uh, performing this uh, procedure. When my patient is young, sorry. Uh, sorry, this, there is something, yeah. Young and active patient, a fresh injury, less than two weeks old, three, four, five type of dislocation, there should be no prior injury or surgery in that area. It's become very difficult to do these surgery. Then we have to go for more uh, larger reconstructive procedures. There should not be any related injury. And if my patient is of heavy demand uh, for the shoulder, then I would prefer to need an augment rather than going for internal bracing. So uh, bracing, I, 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 I have a short question. What is a type three for you? And uh, everybody agree with uh, uh, him? Type three, uh, you try to operation or conservative treatment. What, what is a type three? I I I would uh, discuss with the patient, and uh, I would prefer to do a stabilization in type three. Uh, if if patient uh, wants an active mobility and faster recovery, but otherwise type five are definite indications. So I, I would like to know the because. The Okay. Uh, when we are talking about the rupture of these uh, ligaments, if we sufficiently immobilize them with an elastic or dynamic kind of fixation, I think these ligaments, they heal well and they function well as long as the uh, patient is not overstraining them. And this is the classical dislocation and what I am planning to restore this that the thoracoclavicular distance as well as the acromioclavicular distance should be maintained and that ha that is the key of uh, giving a good outcome to my patients. Uh, as far as the internal bracing concerned, uh, there is a concept that 
people are doing double internal bracing to internally brace both the ligaments that is the conoid and trapezoid part but i personally feel as far as uh, this part of the word is concerned my clavicles are concerned these are literally smaller clavicles i prefer to do a single bundle uh, internal bracing rather than the dual uh, bracing and that too pertaining to this conoid part and once you reduce this to its original place rest of the ligament usually fall in place and it gives a good outcome uh when placing these uh, fixation points i would prefer to fix my point at the the clavicle the junction of the uh, two curvatures of the clavicle and where is the maximum posterior uh, convexity uh, apex like that convexity that is the area where i want to fix my uh, clavicle and that to try to keep it in the center of the clavicle so that the chances of breakage and uh, late failure are not there as far as crocoid is concerned again i would like to keep it on the center of the crocoid at the base of the crocoid mostly when we are doing arthroscopic surgery it's uh, difficult to visualize the medial end and many of the time we are placing it more lateral than medial that it has to be taken care of during the surgery uh, of course uh, we have to have a implant uh, there are two metal implant one on the clavicle side one on the crocoid side whatever we are comfortable uh it should be uh, stabilized with either fiber wire or fiber tape depending on our comfort and uh, level and availability and some kind of jig which we uh, we can align uh, with a guide wire reduce the clavicle put in a guide wire then drill it uh, through that and leave that drill in place to use as a guide for passage of a suture parcel it is very very important to locate the proper clavicle point and then uh protect it with uh, two uh, homan retractors and place my guide wire or jig in the center of the clavicle that that's very very important to prevent any breakage and loosening of the so this is how a uh, uh, dislocated this is basically a type 4 uh, dislocation it looks like and uh, these are my portals a standard posterior uh, inferior portal then a working portal that is a anterior lateral portal and a low anterior portal which is uh, for the <coughs> so this is the ac joint approximately 2 to 3 cm medial my uh, point for the clavicle fixation anterior inferior anterior lateral and this is my standard posterior entry it is a beach chair position which i would prefer because that gives allows me to manipulate a quick diagnostic arthroscopy so that uh, we don't miss anything from the inside of the joint and then we make our anterior lateral portal and uh, with this anterior lateral portal we'll be uh, putting our uh, <coughs> rf probe and try to uh, release the uh, <coughs> rotator interval it's a loose rotator tissue to reach to the uh, under surface of the crocoid and at this point it is very very important that again the whole of the crocoid has to be identified and the medial and lateral border needs to be identified very clearly so that we don't place our uh, jig um, in a wrong position and the chances of breakage of crocoid and failure of fixation occurs once uh, all the soft tissue is removed there's hardly anything there it's a very simple technique just remove it and we can visualize the crocoid under surface very well we really have to reach to the uh, the <coughs> base of the crocoid and uh, then try to clear the medial edge of the crocoid that's important this is your medial edge this is lateral edge and then we once the clearance is done we can switch our wing portal to anterior lateral portal and then try to create the uh, anterior inferior portal so this anterior inferior portal will allow us to place our jig which will be reaching to the under surface of the crocoid this is a jig with, uh, this is an arthrex jig with uh, these few medial and lateral uh, humps which allow us to place it very well nicely under the crocoid and once that is placed and confirmed we can do a drilling from the up again as i said before protecting with the two homans and placing my drill bit in center and first i drill it with a drill bit i prefer to uh, drill it uh, with a reduced position that gives more accurate positioning 
and confirm again that my drill is in the center and just reached outside the crocodile. And once it has been uh, identified, we just drill it over with a four millimeter cannulated drill bit. And this drill is left in place and the guide wire is removed. And inside this, we can put any of the suture passer which we are comfortable with. Uh, <coughs> so that since in this case, we are using a dog button, so we'll be putting, uh, taking the suture passer out from the anterior inferior portal and uh, taking it outside the joint so that we can attach it with the suture and along with that suture, the dog button can go inside and sit on the unit. Once suture is retrieved outside, we remove the drill bit and then we take this uh, whole suture inside and take it uh, on the proximal side. So the, we are pulling it out so, so that now the suture is going in and this, it is very, very important at this point once we are pulling this suture inside that we should be guiding this uh, button to the base because it's a very large button and many of the time it is stuck in this uh, soft tissue. So it has to be literally brought under the uh, coracoid process and it should be seated well so that uh, the future chances of loosening or malpositioning is avoided. Just checking this under the fluoroscopic control under the arthroscopic control that my endo button is seating well or dog button is seating well and the <coughs> stability is there and there is no soft tissue and then we try to pull it, reduce the <coughs> clavicle and fix it with another uh, dog button or whatever metal device we are using on the superficial side and try to tighten it. Once we are tightening it, we just have to confirm very well that joint is well reduced before sitting. We have checked it intra-articularly. It is very well reduced. Check it on the image intensifier that it is well reduced and then the final position we can leave it uh, tied. So you can see that uh, the curricular distance is maintained very well and uh, <clears throat> even the AC joint is uh, maintained. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think it's a very simple technique, quick technique for uh, these kind of managements instead of going for a larger double bundle or uh, augmentation technique. Even if I have to do an augmentation in this case, uh, I can just do it through the same incision and put in a grassless uh, graph to augment in case uh, that is an indication and I want to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I have a question? Yeah, Pancho? sure. Yeah. So um, we can see the very nice your uh, demonstration, but we, we we can control superior inferior uh, the position through the fluoroscope. But uh, how can you know the AP anterior posterior uh, alignment? Because uh, it's not easy to check this AP. Very, very true. That, that's uh, difficult to assess. But uh, once uh, we are actually uh, considering the anatomical points where we are putting our uh, dog button on the coracoid and on the clavicle. So if we are uh, in the center of the clavicle and try to pull it towards the base of the coracoid, that's the original conoid ligament uh, attachment. And that uh, automatically reduce your clavicle in a proper position. And additionally, you can uh, just uh, rotate the fluoroscope and confirm it the anterior matching of the anterior end of the clavicle to the um, acromion, uh, anterior end of the acromion. That is another way. And uh, thirdly, you can go uh, on the AC joint from inside and just uh, confirm under surface of the AC joint whether it is uh, properly done if you are really worried about that. Hey, Bancha, please, please, uh, your, your trick. Yeah, they, okay, you hear me? They brought me. So don't <laughs> meet me again, okay? So, okay. Uh, yeah, I, nice talk. So I, I'm, you don't mention about the AC ligament. So you just concerned about the CC. So nowadays we have a lot of studies prove that the AC ligament also have very important role. So what you are doing is just addressing the 
CC ligament. You have any answer yeah. for that? Yeah, definitely uh, AC ligament is equally important. Yeah. But uh, if, if you see the studies done in the past, even if you put in a cross K wire and you do a lot of fixation techniques have been used and they work well. So what my contention would be to do it in a low demand patient, do it, leave it in case we find any instability of the AC joint further. Yeah. Yeah. I would prefer to do a reconstruction later or if he is a very high demand patient, I might do reconstruction at the same point. You mean reconstruction in a Q setting, right? Augmentation. augmentation. It is repair with augmentation in the same setting. Okay. So uh, you treat the type 3 and type 5 in the same way or not? Type yeah. Three, type 5. Do you uh, mention about the little trabecular fascia? Three, four, five in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would definitely see the demography of the patient. What is the demand of the patient? Okay. And th that would be more important than uh, just the classification of the fracture. Yeah. So there's a question from the audience. They're asking about how, what about your results? Like two years, how about the expert comparing to opposite side? Question from uh, the the, it, we, we have done a very limited cases. We have just done 12 cases. We are following them and uh, patients are doing fine as far as clinical outcome is concerned. Uh, the trouble is in our part of the world, the follow up is not very good and most of the patients, they don't come for follow up until unless they have some problems. It's yeah. very difficult to follow them. So, uh, uh, frankly speaking, I don't have a very clear cut uh, follow up of all my patients. We are trying to retrieve them. We are trying to uh, get a telephonic uh, evaluation of them and till then they, they are doing fine. But I, I don't think that's the correct way of doing it. And unless we examine and do a, uh, radio, a radiographic examination and clinical examination, it's very difficult to comment on that. Okay, thank you. I think I'm done for this AC chart section. Personally, yeah. I go back to you. No, no, no. There's one more question from the audience. So uh, yeah. if, if there's a... The suture is pulled out during the surgery. What is your the, the second option? Uh, yeah. Suture pulled out. Suture pulled out. You you already have uh, made the uh, hole. You can reinsert your suture uh, with that because uh, these holes they are in line with each other. So it's uh, easy to put it again from the top. You insert a uh, suture retriever, suture passer, something from top and reach to the undersurface of the coracoid and you have to redo everything because already the holes are there, four millimeter hole is there. It's easy to locate and uh, do that. So that, that should not be a big issue. Okay. Another short question from the audience. Do you put the KY in and how long you put the KY? To remove it. Uh, K, K wire on the AC joint? Yes. Uh, not, not really, not really. Once uh, it is a type 3, type 4 uh, injuries and I'm able to reduce them well, I would not put in a K wire and uh, <clears throat> I would uh, just uh, put patient on arm sling and mobilize uh, as per their pain tolerance. Once I'm dealing with a fracture of the lateral and the clavicle, I would definitely put two K wires and uh, I'll remove them around four to six weeks time, depending on the tolerance, if it is impinging or causing pain, I might remove it early, otherwise at six weeks you remove it. Okay. I, I have Actually, a, then, uh, Hey, Bancha, can I, can I ask? Yes. The, yeah. the, the old faculty, the same question, type three, what is, Bancha, what is your type three? Type three, I let the patient choose because it's controversy. No, 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 no. How can you know that is type 3? Or type 3. The, yeah. the AC joint, just, it just goes subluxation above the uh, uh, chromium. It's not that high. So, uh, that uh, high Su, Dr. Su or Dr. Chiang, do you have any uh, clear the idea which is a type 3? Of course, I got clear, clear idea. Uh, the day I drink is a type three. The day <laughs> I don't is type. Three. <laughs> no, so, so, I mean, according to, to Rockwood, uh, there's two uh, elements. 
to differentiate from type three and type five. Okay. First is how high you get it. Type three is within a hundred percent. Type five yeah. is between a hundred percent and three hundred percent. That's number yeah. one. Number two, during the surgery, in a type five, you can see there will be a more injury to the fascia, to the uh, trapezius and the deltoid fascia together. And the whole digital, two, digital like five third of the article is uh, totally smooth. No insertion of muscle anymore. So that uh, end of clavicle may go way up high or even posterior. So you need two points to determine whether it's a type three or type five. But I have to say, if you do not go to the surgery, only judging by that 100 to 300, some of the type five can become type three in a week. That happens. Mm. That in my patient, that happens. So uh, for me, the type three and the, the plain X-ray reduced, but uh, we, we have some distress on the AC joint, the 30%, less than 100% uh, displacement, that is type 3. So I, yeah. I used to recommend the conservative treatment for the type 3. So again, plain X-ray is almost 10%, uh, 30% displacement, but uh, uh, book down with the stress and then 100 less than 100 percent displacement and then i would say the type 3 uh the ac injury yeah well one thing one thing must be remember that we are talking about uh, these measurement and everything on a weighted x-ray the patient carrying weight and with a down pull because a normal shoulder x-ray might be fallacious so we have to take that before we are commenting that what uh, type of uh, dislocation we are dealing with so that that's important yeah thank you hey bancha do you have a yeah. last question from the audience yeah yeah the question yeah. is talking about the colloquial process because in our asian people colloquial is very small so do you have any experience about the colloquial fracture or how can you deal with that uh not not yet not yet uh, because uh, we are trying to put a 2.5 millimeter uh, guide wire in the center of the clavicle and the area where we are putting, uh, as I shown, uh, that area is quite flat and broad. So uh, if you post it in the center and the center of the uh, coracoid, uh, th this will not happen because we are using 2.5 guide wire with a 4 mm cannulated drill bit. Yeah, so that yeah. doesn't happen. If your placement is eccentric, that will happen or if your patient is overusing or zealous before injury they are able to do all the heavy activity it might happen it has not happened to me uh, till date but it definitely it can happen any day yeah the problem is they ask it. many times it is not one attempt there's multiple attempts so you have multiple hole in the coracoid and this can yeah the list of fracture of coracoid that that that's why it is important to place your hole first in the very first place before you are drilling and use a proper jig which gives you an accurate placement because uh, you are depending so much on this uh, placement of the hole that that's important. okay thank you firstly i i'm done thank you okay. yeah okay. okay no one more one more, yeah, one more moderation hey hey, moderation in the next hey Pancha. <laughs> Over time, over the lead. Another three talks. Another one. Uh, Professor Su. Professor yeah. Su. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Su is the next. May I have, may I have a question? Yeah, I think we can come back again if we have enough time, personally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your AC is my lover. <laughs> okay. So, next talk. Professor Y. It's your turn now. You're talking about the does the numbers of loaded suture affect the suture holding strength of the knotless suture anchor? Was well, so Wai Lang Su from Taiwan, please. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks for uh, having me here. Um, and I would like to. Um, in uh, presents uh, our recent research. 
uh, my topic is um, does the number of loaded sutures affect the suture holding strength of not with suture anchors? I am um, Warren Su from Taiwan. Next. Okay, so, um, the, the suture bridge technique is a, a common technique for rotary car repair, which has uh, come into um, general use and uh, is associated with good clinical outcomes and uh, improved uh, tendon bone healing. Next, not with suture anchors. Oh, oh sorry, uh, uh, back to the, uh, the previous slide. Uh, I'm sorry, please uh, go back. Yes, this one, okay. So the Nautilus suture anchors were developed to uh, enable secure repairs on the lateral. Uh, various designs were developed with different methods of suture fixation mechanisms, uh, such as uh, internal fixation, external fixations and the uh, hybrid fixation mechanisms uh, to prevent the repairs from uh, loosening through slippage of the sutures past the anchors. Next, please. Uh, the uh, optimal medial rock configurations of uh, suture bridge technique are still controversial. So various types of medial rock configurations of the suture bridge technique have been reported Numerous studies reported that increasing the number of suture strengths across tendon repairs improved the strength of repairs by sharing the tension load. And uh, uh, multiple suture limbs may also minimize the number not tying in medial load to avoid the tissue strangulations and the reduce step to failures. Next. Therefore, multiple loading sutures on single nutless anchors would be a demand. Next. However, no previous studies has addressed uh, the issue of the capacity of uh, nutless anchors uh, to be loaded with multiple sutures. Next. Therefore, the purpose of uh, these studies was to uh, clarify whether the number of rotated sutures could affect the fixation mechanism of nutless suture anchors, and to compare the mechanical performance of three types of internal fixation nutless anchors while they were loaded with two or four sutures. Next. The methods. Next. So we use the foam plug and the study three kinds of nutless sutures anchors with internal fixation mechanism. Next. The first one was preprint. It applied the internal fixation mechanism by clamping the sutures with its core and the button compartment. Next. The second one was a pop lock. It has two wings that deploy to hold the anchors in positions the, the second second one was pop lock, and uh, it applied the internal fixation mechanisms by uh, clamping the sutures with uh, its outer and the inner compartment. Next, the third one was the relax. Uh, its internal fixation mechanism is also known as the ratcheting mechanism, which is accomplished by uh, turning the knob on the anchor insertion handle to three four turns. Next. Next, uh, yeah. uh, so a custom made cyclic tensile loading system was used for the biomechanical test. Next, the, the biomechanical testing protocol involved preloading, cyclic loading, and the load to failure. Next, so the number of uh, completed cycles. Ultimate failure load and the ultimate failure mode were recorded. So according to a previous research, we define clinical failure as future slippage of three millimeters. Next. The sample size of each group was set to five anchors.
based on our pilot study. Next, the result. Next, uh, for clinical failure load, both preprint and the pop drug perform stronger clinical failure loads by a quadruple loaded. Next, for ultimate failure load, both preprint and the pop drug also perform stronger ultimate failure load via quadruple loaded. However, Redex show a certain trend of weaker mechanical performance via quadruple loaded. The, the p value was 0 0.056. Next. So regarding the system failure mode, all of the testing specimens in the current studies fail of future slippage. Next. So we took the anchors out from the form blocks after testing to figure out anchor body breakage patterns. Next. And there were no significant dif deformities on footprint after testing. So for public paper drug, there were mild anchor body deformity of the outer compartment. However, for redex, there were unilateral breakage of the eyelet on anchor body by suture cutting in double rotated group and by lateral breakage of the eyelet in a quadruple loaded group. Next, the discussions. Okay, next. So in our in our studies, uh, both preprint and the pop drug show stronger mechanical performance while loaded with two more sutures. However, Redex show a certain trend of weaker mechanical performance while loaded with two more sutures. Next. So in other words, the clamping not least anchors show stronger mechanical performance while loaded with two more sutures. While ratcheting not least anchors show a certain trend of weaker mechanical performance while loaded with two more sutures. Next. So uh, this result suggests that uh, while deploy the redex by turning the knob to advance the suture the anchors will be expanded and deformed. Next. While loaded with uh, multiple sutures, ratcheting anchors show greater deformity, which could uh, undermine the microstructures of peak anchors. Next. So this could be approved by the failure mode. In these pictures, the quadrant quadruple loaded group could have a weaker peak shear, which suffered by later breakage of the eyelid before the anchor could reach a greater strength. Next. So uh, uh, therefore, according to the result and the fixation philosophy, uh, clamping not least anchors, which suffers no deformities during deployment could be a better choice for multiple loading. Next. So we further analyze the single suture mechanical strength of uh, each structure. The single suture mechanical strength uh, equal to the total failure load divided by the number of loaded sutures. Next. So in clinical failure load, we found that all groups show single suture strength decline while loading two more sutures and the significant risk for the redex group. Next. Uh, in ultimate failure load, we found that all groups also show single suture strength decline while loading two more sutures and also more significant risk for the redex, uh, redex groups. So the strength of single sutures in all three types of anchors declines after extra loading sutures, especially significant in redex. So in modified suture bridge construct, a loading distribu distributions could be uh, unbalanced in a repair construct. The, de the decrease of suture single suture strength could result in a potential weak point 
of those structures. So finally, uh, back to our questions. Um, does the number of rotated sutures affect the suture holding strength of nutless suture anchors? Uh, my answer is uh, yes. The number of rotated sutures affect the suture holding strength of specific nutless suture anchors. A camping nutless suture anchors uh, could be a better choice for multiple loading sutures. The degree, the decrease of single suture strength uh, could result in a potential weak point of the structures, which could be uh, concerns in a multiple loading nutless suture bridge construct. Thank you. That's my presentation. Okay. Good. So, um, so the what is your this this articles you're comparing many companies. So, is there any um, a me mechanical proof that uh, which company is better? So, it's critical to say that, right? You, you're comparing Smith and Fields with um, Tech. How can you conclude that? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, there are about many um, uh, suture anchors designed for the later role, the not with suture anchors. So uh, in this article, so we just uh, compare the internal fixation, uh, fixation mechanisms of the suture anchors uh, instead of the the, uh, the the other suture anchor, like the external fixation mechanism, uh, like the the three duck or pop duck. So uh, for uh, for the uh, the internal fixation mechanism, uh, suture anchor uh, in these articles. Uh, the results uh, show the the redex uh, has the, the superior mechanical performance of fire loaded two sutures. However, the, uh, when the redex loaded uh, more sutures, uh, its the mechanical uh, force declines very fast. Yeah. So the mm, my recommendation is that uh, when we are uh, uh, try to use the multiple suture limbs uh, on the uh, later rows. Right? The, yeah. the choice of the nutless, uh, uh, the, the nutless suture anchors could be the cramp cramping mechanism, like uh, the, the footprint or the pop rack. So uh, in, in these studies, the, the footprint seems a little bit better than the pop rack. But, but, but you cannot say that because Dr. Su, this is the testing in the lab. Right? Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah. in the practice, maybe you have no difference. Yes. Right. Yeah. So this is the testing in the lab. You cannot conclude and you say that this is better because it's just uh, yeah, in, the, in, the, uh, in the lab. This is a sample lab, right? From Fandeva lab. Yes, this, this this is the, the this is the uh, clinical test in the lab. So we we cannot translate these results to the, to the clinical uh, practice. Sure, I, I, I agree. Yeah. So you have any any further investigation or any further uh, paper in human? Okay. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yes. Um. Uh, 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 there are many uh, literatures uh, that compares the the many uh, modified suture bridges, uh, the clinical results, uh, uh, but but it's um, it's very difficult to tell uh, the, the which suture anchor is better uh, in this uh, clinical scenario. So so this is just the uh, the, the, the the result in the lab only. Okay. So there's a question from the audience about what is done on materials from the same company. You're, you're discussing about the material or not? Uh, I'm sorry, you mean the... Material. Materials. Oh, yeah. Uh, you mean, yes, uh, in this study, so we, uh, we compared the, uh, the suture anchor, uh, the made of uh, the, the peak 
yeah. So we don't compare. Well, we don't. We don't compare the the the, the other the other uh, materials, the other composites like the uh, like the the the, the, the P, P, PLLA or PLGA. Yes. So that's another question. They're asking, what is the final conclusion? Which not less suture anchor is is better? <laughs> Which one is better? <laughs> I cannot say. Mm, yeah, do, uh, just uh, according to the results uh, in these articles, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the, the footprint uh, seems a little bit better, uh, while its performance uh, is, is a little bit better, uh, while loaded with double, ro double loaded sutures or four suture limbs, yeah, the, the footprint is a little bit better, but not reach the uh, statistically significant. Yeah. Uh, I say to that, it is not political right in a comment. <laughs> <with that. laughs> yeah, any comment? Actually, uh, I, I personally feel that uh, it depends a lot on so many things. Uh, how you're using, where you're using, how much force you're putting, when you, it, it comes to the clinical practice. It's very, it might be a very different situation uh, when you use it in the lab and in actual situation. When I'm using my anchor, I would like to force my anchor so much that uh, how much it can tolerate. I, I, I think uh, it, it depends on so many things. Uh, what is available to me, where I'm using, what's the bone quality, how, what type of patient I'm doing it. There's so many factors involved. It's very difficult to uh, give a judgment on that. Yeah. Sure, I agree. Okay. So, Bancha? Yes? Uh, your job is uh, done okay <laughs> so we, we should move the 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 third session okay. thank you the dr sanjay dr uh, wei Lon su and the bancha and then uh, we will invite the uh, dr Jian from china as a moderator for the last session so please Jian, start thank you professor lee so we have last uh, speakers uh, remain one uh, the first may we uh, introduce the first speaker Professor Ben Chachetuj is from Thailand. Thank you to give a presentation on a three, three in one haul, a new less invasive speedy rotator cup repair using triple lug Y nuts and pop lock. You see, Ben's topic is very political, right? <laughs> now the yeah. microphone is yours. Dr. Ben Chah from Thammasat, University of Thailand. So thank you, Lin Watek and Lemitech team, Professor Lee, for this kind of invitation. Uh, I'm talking about the three-in-one hole, a new less invasive and speedy loaded cuff repair using triple loaded y not and pop lock. So this article changed my concept about the knot tying and the fit from the middle row. Uh, you see from the video, you can see that the west lock obstruct by the knot tying. Okay. And this article mentioned that the conventional suture bridge technique may help up to 59% of type 2 tear or the muscular tenderness tear of the loaded cuff. Okay? So it's less common in single row and le not less suture bridge technique. So after, after this, I look in the articles. Professor Lee also report about the, his modified Mason Allen's middle row stitch. They have less uh, type 2 tear comparing to the conventional knot tying technique. So I did the study, the conventional knot tying and the knotless, we call that a dozen, that's 12 sutures, to triple load, knotless suture bridge technique. And we evaluate the average pressure and also the contact area and pressure distribution in cadavers. And we found that in the conventional knot tying, there is a lot of very high contact pressure at the middle footprint comparing to the knotless okay, suture bridge technique. And that's why we have type 2 tear because of the very high contact pressure at the middle footprint. Okay? And also we, we evaluate the contact area. We found that the contact area of the knotless adolescent suture bridge technique is significantly higher comparing to the conventional knot tying technique okay so after that we did the knotless, less 
Okay, we stop doing the knot tying. We do not less. Okay, and we found that our result is getting better. We have less type two tear, and our retaliation is less comparing to the knot tying group. Okay. So, this is one of the patient referred to me. Yeah, he has the loaded cuff tear after the really nice loaded cuff repair. You see that the tear site is proximal. This is at the muscle tendinous junction. You see that the tear site is at the medial footprint. So I did the loaded cup revision for this patient without removing the footprint. Okay. So after that, the, we use a triple load. Um, why not? And also the pop lock. So after that, the patient have good results, and you see the MRI is healed nicely. Okay, this is the uh, not less suture bridge, and we published this article, the technique to repair the muscular tendinous tear or type two tear, and uh, report in the arthroscopic technique, and we prefer this technique very much and try to popularize this technique because it's more anatomic. Uh, reduction, decrease dog ear formation, better pressure distribution, and decrease tension at the muscular tendon junction, result in type 2 tear. But one day I talked to Professor Juhan O. Juhan O said, Oh, Bansha, your technique looks so nice. Why don't you put the camera into the joint to see what happened inside? Okay, you look from outside, it's nice. So I, I believe him. So after that, this is one example that also changed my practice you see that i did the very nice very secure fixation a dorsal suture bridge when i put the camera inside the joint oh my god you see that there's the medial row is not is not compressed but this patient i i make one knot in the back and not less in the front so you see that in the back here this one is very nice contact but this one i didn't tie the knot they still have gap underneath the loaded the cuff so that changed my practice. Thank you, Dr. Johanno. Okay, you see, look outside is good, but there's a gap inside. Okay. So after that, I tried to change my technique. So even these patients, she has the gap underneath the loaded the cuff. I check the MRI post op. It look not too not too bad. So that's why my result is good because even I didn't tie the knot, but the cuff looked nice. But I'm not sure that. It is really good because from the view you did you see that there's still the gap underneath. So I propose this idea. We call this a three in one. Okay, not hole in one. This is three in one. Okay, so one hole I put three suture. One, two, three, four. You will have twelve sutures. So these twelve sutures you go three, 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 three. So you see the color is different, right? So we try to go to the anterior part this is the comma tissue area also we're going to the infraspinatus because we want our loaded cuff to be really the footprint will be really wide suture attachment and area of contact will be wider okay so after that you just tie three knot the first knot is the yellow one the second one is a white one and in the middle you connecting the front and the back I use different sutures so I will not confuse the green one and the purple one. Okay? And we leave this six suture on the middle side. Okay? So you understand? We have 12 sutures, but we make only three knots. Okay? So and after that, you spread your suture like this. Okay? So in the lateral low, there will be six and six. Okay? So that's combining the knot tying and knot less. Okay? This is the high bridge. We didn't tie the knot that much because if you tie the knot, you make a too close, you can cut through the tissue. So that's why I make this spread. Okay, so the whole the up, uh, distance between the hole is about eight millimeters. So you can see that this is an after repair. You can see that's a knot tying and also that's a knot less. It's a combination, right? Like that way. Okay. So that's my idea. Okay. So on the lateral row, you need to put the first in the very anterior, cross to the bicipital group. In that area, the bone quality is also very good. In the back, I try to put my anchor very really close to the infraspinatus. That area is very really close to the posterior cortex. 
Okay, so that area also have very good bone stock. Okay, so using this technique, you widen the lateral footprint. Also, so the suture bridge will be very wide, and you have better contact area. I use big chair position. So when I put the ankle in the back, I do internal rotation. When I do anterior ankle, I put external rotation. So it's very easy for the big chair position. But for the lateral decubitus, maybe it's not so easy to rotate like this. Okay. So that is my yeah. So like like this, this is an L shaped chair. So first you need to decide. This is a comma tissues. You put the first hole here, second one here, third one here, and another one close to the infraspinatus. Okay. So you need to have the good design like this one. First we make a micro fracture at the footprint. Okay. We use the uh, triple load. Why not? Okay. And then pass the suture in. Okay, like we design. If there's L shape, very important, you need to secure this apex. We call the apex reduction. So you pass one suture in the anterior cuff into the rotator, uh, into the comma tissues. Okay. So the hole bit the distance between the hole will be wider because we try to spread it. So you have less chance of the strangulation. Okay? And then we put the pop lock on the lateral side, okay, like that way. Okay. So this is the way I do okay, for the lateral low cuff. Um, okay, that way you have uh, combined notch and not less. Okay. So this is an article for that. If you put the anchors too far to lateral, you can cut through the tissue. You should put it medial to the uh, rotator cable, right? The hole between the rotator cuff should be should be not too not too close. If you go too close, you can cut through the tissues. If you put air suture into the rotator the cuff, you cut through. That's why there's a lot of type 2 tear in the past. Okay, so now I know we need to spread it wider. Okay, so we still have the draw of the suture bridge, not less suture bridge for the bursal side tear. So for bursal side tear, I try to preserve my articular side and we can use this suture bridge. Okay, for the bursal side tear. Okay. No, not tying for this bursal side tear, and we publish this in the arthroscopy journal. So another patient, this is a massive loaded cuff tear. She has supraspinatus, infraspinatus tear. is a very big size tear. So first, you need to uh, release the loaded cuff from the colloquial process. Release the colloquial ligament, right? Make sure that your cuff is tension free. So this is the key concept when you repair the loaded cuff and find the apex of the cuff, okay? First is the tissue mobilizations, and then we reduce the apex of the rotator cuff. We make a high bridge, not tying and also not less, okay? And finally, we get this result, okay? So this is the MRI after the surgery, and she has a good function after that. So this is another patient, she is 47 years old. Ladies, I just done it last week. So the way I tell you the trick, you make two, okay, and one, not three in one hole because it's impossible. It will, it, the suture cannot pass. So you make two, we have one knot with two suture, another knot with one suture, and then you can pass this into your rotator cuff. And this is less trauma to your rotator cuff. Just one hole, you have three sutures, okay, like that way. And then you try to spread your lot or the distance between the hole, not make it too close, okay, and then not tying, so I tie the knot like I show you in the diagram, we tying the first one anteriorly, the second one posteriorly, and the middle one, this is, you see that, that's different colors, okay, so you're not confused, this is in the middle, so you have only three not tying, okay, and the leg is free, okay, after that, you make the lateral low, Okay, same like I show you. You, uh, the first hole should be close to the bicipital groove, especially if the patient have osteoporosis. This area is very strong bone, and another hole is in the back, close to the infraspinatus. Okay, and that is the final repair. So you have not tying, and also you have the not less. Okay, so after that, I put my. Camilla into the joint. 
So you see that this is a patient that I changed my practice, right? But this is the this is this patient we did not tie. You see that is is totally different left and right. This is not less. This is not tying, but it's limited not tying. Only three not tying. Okay. This is another patient has a massive cough tear from trauma. Have the severe loaded the cough tear supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and then proximal migration. So this can be the patient I will try to repair your cough because this trauma is six months already. And the patient have you see muscle atrophy? It looks so bad, right? So anyway, we do uh, we literally make five portals. Okay. So first we try to pull the cough. It's it's very big. Cannot reduce to the footprint. Okay. The next step is to release. I think this is a very critical step. You need to release your cuff from above, from the colloquial process, release the colloquial humeral ligament, right? After that, this is colloquial process, right? Most of the time in the chronic, massive loaded cuff is always stuck there, okay? After you release that, and also this patient, I try to release the uh, capsule also, the IGHL and also NGHL, okay, the post -off, that would reduce the post-off uh, stiffness, okay. Medial side, most of the time, I use only two, but this patient, we use three because it's extending to the infraspinatus also, okay. And then we pass the suture in, okay. So after that, we make a knot tying on the medial side and we try to reduce the apex, okay. This is like a big L-shaped tear, okay. So we tie the knot. Also, we combine, and this is the. Uh, but the lateral row we always use only two lateral row. This patient I use three middle row, right? But for the lateral row, I put two, right? One cross to the bicep group, right cross to the posterior cortex, right? So that is the. Actually, a, a pop lock can put seven. The maximum I put is seven. Right, this patient, I think I put seven, not six, seven and seven, right? So post-op rehabilitation, we need to be very gentle because it's a very massive tear. So this is three months after that, the patient is good. External rotation is getting better. He's a forenus, he's a western. Yeah, and also his cup function is getting much better. Before surgery, he is the pseudoparalytic patient. And this is cut heal nicely. Okay, this infraspinatus and also supraspinatus healing. So we collecting the patients now using this new technique. And till now we quite happy with our results. Comparing our not tying, totally not not less. So I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. Professor Lee, yeah, my teacher, Doctor O, my friends. I'm in the middle. I'm. Not, the, not tying with not less in the middle. The benefit of this technique is less trauma to the cuff. You have only four holes in your cuff, less butt supply disturbance, less strangulation, and less operating time. Okay. Thank you very much. The, this year we moved the, our app class 2020 to December. It is, this is pre course, is the irreparable loaded cuff course with three masks here. Uh, Teru Mihata, El Hassan, and Pascal Balo. Okay, please come to Thailand. See you in Thailand in December 3 to 5 and visit our website, appcast2020.org. Thank you. Thank you, Pencha. Uh, uh, you show us a very beautiful cases. So before anybody have a question, I'm a little bit confused. You said you're in the middle. You said you're between the Nautilus medial row and the not tying medial row but for right. me you're definitely medial row not tying you have three knots in the medium yeah. row usually i just do two yeah so why do you say you're in the middle you're totally a medial tying guy why do you say you're in the middle you tie three knots on the medial row yeah but and you're not worried about the type two retail anymore oh no because uh from the study, we found that if you put the space between the hole, okay, more than 7.5, you have less chance of circulation, have less chance of high to tear. Okay? So let's be clear. Yeah, let's be clear. 
that yes. you're tying the suture from yes. different anchors. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So That's instead right. of suture coming from the same suture anchor, you're tying yeah. two suture anchors together. Right. I did this thing. Sometimes I do a double pulley. Yeah, so that's your point. Okay. Yeah. You like it or not? Oh, yeah, I like it. I like it. I, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question is that uh, once you are doing your initial time, whatever you are doing in the initial period, you have shown that the medial uh, fixation was lifting off from footprint. Okay. Uh, what was the clinical outcome of those patients? I'm, I'm sorry because uh, there was disturbance in the videos. We, we, we can't see that. Okay. Uh, so what was the outcome? What was the clinical outcome? Clinical outcome is pretty good. So this patient, I'm really, I'm really sorry. I feel so not so happy because I already put the lateral low. I put the scope in. I see that. Yes. Yeah. But yes. I did I start <clears throat> after that. It's nicely healed and the patient is doing well, right? So I'm, but from my what my uh, arthroscope view, we see that there's a gap. Okay. That that that's what I was coming to because if your lateral row fixation is uh, well over the bone and it has healed well, a medial lift off might be a boon in disguise because once you adduct your uh, shoulder, it is going to come back to its uh, original place and that will be maintaining it. It's blood supply and vascularity much better than just strangulating it into the place. So may, may, maybe uh, you don't need to change that. <laughs> you sure? Um, there is a question. We are, we are running out of time, but there's a question from the audience saying that why did you uh, doing the lateral row fixation first with no old nautilus, leaving the suture, few suture later, tying the median row? And that will give you a more clear idea that you can press down the median row. Do you get my question? You no. should. Uh, why no. didn't you to do all the sutures on the lateral row first? Yes. And then that lateral did not incorporate the, the sutures that will be tied on the median row. You have a lot of sutures. Yeah. So use the suture that is not tying to the lateral first, then go to the suture that you will tie, but not come through the uh, not least anchor on the lateral. Yeah. You got the question? Yeah, I, I got it. But yeah. I use a suture, Chunyan. I have 12 sutures. I put it, all the sutures, the lateral row, because I want, I want the wide area of foot of coverage, foot beam contact from so the side. So you need 12 sutures, both, six each on the lateral row. So you're, you're not wasting any limbs, right? No, no, no. Okay. Let me, let me ask you. Yes. You have two anchors, th uh, three suture and 12 suture end. You're mm -hmm. passing twice at a time, right? Two suture at a time. That means you're piercing the tendon six times. No, six times. No, no, no. I, you're two I in a hole. You're two in a hole. I have four holes only. I have, so you, have you have three suture in the hole? Yeah, three. Three oh. by four is twelve. Okay. Yeah, three okay. by four is twelve. Yeah. Because the, the area of the figure is not that wide. So if you put more than four, I think the distance will be shorter. Okay. You know? Yeah. Especially you know what? Okay. I yeah. think we're already out of time. I don't think there's maybe some kind of a, you know similarity between your talk and our last talk with Professor Lee. So we'll go on to Professor Lee's last talk, and if we still have the time, we can put the discussion later, all right? Thank all you, right. Benjamin, again for your excellent video and for your excellent presentations. Thank you. Now we'll come to the end. The last, not only the, the least, but the most important person of our webinar, Professor Junger Lee, to give us the last speech about arthroscopic rotator cuff repair using the why not RC with the tape. Professor Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Xian. So uh, I want to talk about how to optimize the double low rotator cuff repair. So sometimes we meet the medium size or large size rotator cuff tear like this. I already introduced this uh, three passes for the rotator cuff repair. That is a semi-circular uh, line 
that is a subclavian divisor and the posterior infraspinous the passes. So I say the three sisters passes again the visor and posterior infraspinous the passes uh, with the use, uh, using with uh, this T handle. So uh, the first that is a subclavian passes for the anterior cuff like this and then a path through the rotator cuff and then they catch uh, this uh, tiger wire this is a PDS number one and retrieve back and the, the same procedure I choose the another tiger wire left to the blue one is a uh, tape so that I catch the rotator cuff just lower to the musculotendinous junction pass through the nubai's uh, the passage for the the middle cuff and that that is the same procedure I like uh, this t-handle so I, I want to introduce uh, this T-hand. The length is about uh, 110 millimeter. The 40 degree angle as a tip diameter is a 1.5. So uh, what is the advantage with this T-hand? It's a bite. Bite whatever you want, any any, any place, and a very easy path under the rotator cuff so uh, this one is a very a uh, small size of uh, a tip 1.5 millimeter and I look at this even the very narrow space comparing with the scorpion very easy path through the rotator cuff that is a T handle so uh, I make a, a lift stop the stitch, the transverse tie to uh, prevent a cut off the rotator cuff. And this is a tape for the lateral uh, low. So I make a lateral uh, pile of hot. And then look at this. There's no motion during the the screen like this. No motion, so we don't need the additional the over tension on the uh, rotator cuff. So this is a final view. This is tape. So not the least double uh, suture bridge technique. So once again the screen like this no motion, no over tangering with this uh, uh, why not tape. So sometimes we do the additional the stitch because uh, this Lara Low has uh, the additional blue tiger wire. If you have uh, some uh, dog ear, we can compress down with this additional the stitch like this so there is a final view pre op and post op the suture bridge technique with wire tape so we can get the optimized rotator cuff compression look at this this is a post op the MRI pretty good good compression without over tangering with this uh, wire tape so I want to talk about the Perry anchor cyst formation. I compare the old suture type, bioabsorbable or peak type, the anchor. Look at this, retail rate. Retail rate will be higher when we have uh, the hues, peri anchor bone and uh, the cyst like this. So, uh, and, and, and the second is uh, I check the bone marrow uh, density before the surgery. Group A is a very weak bone. 
group C is a very strong one. So, uh, and then I check that this depth to anchor from here to here, good contact just under the subchondral, uh, the bone. Look at this. Th this group C is a strong bone. This A is a weak bone. So that means uh, I make a ball and the ball just located under the inner cortex comparing with this. This one is a 6.3. That means uh, my ball is located somewhere in the cancer spawn area, not on the, on the uh, surface of the subchondral bone. So how much move after the follow up? The group A, the weak bone is only 1.3 millimeter comparing with this 3.8 millimeter. That means that 4 millimeter migration during the follow up because uh, th this my ball located in the cancer bone area instead of on the surface or the inner cortex of the, the bone. So this is uh, the, my conclusion. The higher uh, the strong bone, uh, the depth to anchor will be deeper. And the average migration is 2.8 millimeter during the follow up. The deeper is uh, the mi migration is uh, higher uh, during the follow up. But uh, this my uh, the final follow up is not bad. Even there is some uh, migration. So therefore, the minimal migration according to the OSHA type anchor was not the clinical the meaning. Thank you. Thank you, Jiang. Question. I can hear you. Sorry, Jiang. Yeah. Okay. No. They just uh, mute me. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now. Okay, so they mute me. They only keep you active and they mute everybody. <laughs> so, it's a very good talk and thank you for saving the, uh, the time for uh, us all. It's a very good talk there. So, let me be clear. It's also regarding the Betcha's presentation. Professor Lee, you published that very good article about type 2 repair. So, tell us now. Do you tie knot on the median row now? So uh, now uh, I just introduced the, this the double low, the suture bridge technique, but uh, I now the prefer the single low. So why I choose the, the, this single low? I think this is a rotator cup healing. I mean, the, we, we every day say bone to tendon healing, but I, I, it, it, it's, uh, we misunderstood. It's not the bone to uh, tendon healing, just the scar formation between the tendon to bone. So I, I like the single low, but the, my indication of the suture bridge is uh, if we have a uh, uh, good quality of the rotator cup with a good configuration, with a good flexibility, good mobility, and um, rotator cup, tendon, true tendon, uh, remain the tendon is wide, or if we have uh, the huge footprint, when, when we look at the, the scope, that is uh, my indication for the, the suture bridge technique. But uh, uh, when I look at the Bancha's the video, his technique is pretty good, but uh, too many, too many strengths, They're terrible. So yeah. with a single you tie your median row for some very good tendon, a wide torn tendon end, yeah, good yeah. quality of tendon end, and good configuration, very good tension. You still tie it up, right? Yeah, that, and then I can I choose the the, the suture bridge technique. Mm -hmm. your, okay. your technique is a suture bridge, but you call single row, right, Osali? No, 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 no. What, he, what Dr. Lee referred to suture bridge is that a traditional now tying medial and cross, criss cross lateral. That's a suture bridge. 
Yeah. So well, when I, Dr. Lee said single row, he only used the lateral row anchor without tying the median row. So he right. saw it a single row. Is that because right, Mr. Lee? You, you know that during the follow of the MRI, there's a, some, uh, the fibrosis is <laughs> on the surface of the repair uh, uh, the rotator cuff. So that is a fibrosis. That is a scar formation. Even we uh, fix that that is a, a point fixation with a single low. We don't worry about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. similar, similar idea also come from Pascal Boileau and also from Steven Snyder. Steven Snyder only ties a median roll, a scoy roll. And Pascal Boileau using a similar technique as Professor Lee did. But when maybe that's in the arm, you will see the gap. But, yeah. you know, a lot of the time, the gap there is not a problem because you're not abduct your arm on day one, right? Sometimes you just give a, a sling or a small abduction pillow here, and that thing is here. Only if you abduct, then the median row have a bigger gap, bigger gap. So it depends on personal experiences. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, go ahead. Bancha. Do you do you put the scope inside the joint after the repair? <laughs> yeah, don't, my don't audience. Challenge when, when, Professor Lee will be stupid. When, when I do the live study, every uh, the audience ask me, please, yeah. please put your scope into the joint. But yeah. uh, when I look at the joint, it's not bad. So uh, you, you worry about the like as a partial uh, interarticular partial tear. But uh, I say again. I don't worry about it. That one, the finally, the scar formation on the surface of the rotator cuff. Yeah. Right. So I so once again, the, that is a, just a technique. Single low or the suture bridge or the double low. How can we how can we prevent over tension? That is our uh, idea. Right. Okay. Okay. I see. Sandra has a question. Sandra, please. Yeah. Yeah, uh, how to prevent over tension as well as how to prevent over compression and strangulation of the tendon. That's very important. And I, uh, as uh, Bancha was uh, very much concerned, I'll be very happy if I see my flap is rising a little on the middle side and sitting well on the lateral side. Yeah. I'll be more happy with that. I know I'm not strangulating my tendon. Right. So, so the concept of cup repair is number one. You need to repair the cup under no tension, tension free. So the key to do that is to have a release, good release of the loaded cup. Because many times the cup is chronic and there's some contracture, especially the colocohumeral ligament. So you need to make sure and do the cup mapping until you you are sure or confirm that your cup can be used nicely. Okay, really not. And you need to make a nice mapping because uh, many times you did it in the wrong way so if you did a very good cup mapping most of the time the last cup is always like diagonal reduction so after you make sure that you can reduce in the proper position then you decide to repair the cup okay that is the first thing tension free repair and minimal trauma to the cup do not make many holes in the cup because that can <laughs> it. it was so funny that you speak this. Do not put <laughs> many holes in the cup, but yeah. you got those and sutures there, man. No, 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 no. I have only four holes. All right. <laughs> All right. Holes, 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 holes. I use the spectrum. Spectrum is very small. Okay. So Ooh. if suture can pass through this spectrum, that means you have less trauma to the cup. You know what? Maybe next time you should try to pre handle. It's even better. Right, <laughs> yeah, no, he's even better. And right. So, and uh, yeah, there, there's another question coming from the audience. Uh, I think we're I'm six minutes not. away, away 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. in the Professor Lee's zone. So, I think uh, we have to get to give some time for for the uh, audience. Uh, Dr. Zhang from China, I have a question for both the uh, venture and Professor Lee. Mm -hmm. If you meet a patient with very soft bone, very osteoporotic, greater tuberosities, yeah, and would you do only the lateral row like Professor Lee did for for the, the single row fixation or for bencha as if severe osteoporosis make a difference on your decision making? Bencha, you first. 
I will tell you the media role is no problem for the awesome politic because really, you, really, yeah, especially if you use the white hot, you can you can change the direction. This is a GT, right? You can go underneath sub control. So I never pull out why not zero percent. I will tell you, it's very it's, strong. Maybe you're not only passing the sub control bone, you'll go right into the glenoid. <laughs> yeah, I go I go to sub control. Yeah, this is honest. I never have problem with my video. Okay, you go underneath the sub control and no tapping, and okay. you use the shaver only. Do not use the burr. Whenever you use the burr, you you make the soft bone to get rusty. Just use the shaver. Make a micro fracture, and after that, you use a super what low. About, what about the lateral roll? You said medium roll is good. What about the lateral roll? Lateral roll, you go to the bicipital group. That's okay. good. Anterior. Yeah. And is good. And another one is close to the left, the posterior cortex. Right. Close to the That's a very good point. And put it lower. That's a very good point. Yeah. Professor Lee, yeah. would you have any concerns in a very osteoporotic patient using your single row fixation? Yeah, so uh, before the, my technique, I want to uh, ask you, all of you, how can you know the, this soft bone? So I, I, I checked the, always uh, PMD before the surgery. Second is uh, I used to use uh, 18 gauge the spinal leader, and then I tried to uh, put into the bone. So if a little bit strong, factor. yeah. If is it is if easy to penetrate this the spinal leader, I, I gave up. So what is uh, my next uh, procedure? I agree with uh, the bunch of media low is media side is a little bit stronger than the uh, the GT at, at top. So uh, we don't worry about the media low, a lateral low. So we can choose uh, far away from the GT top. Because they have the cortical bone, so uh, we can choose this uh, the lateral side. The second is uh, even I do the far away from the GT, the pull out, and then I do the open. Always I do the open because uh, this chance also uh, the fixation is much better than the the anchor fixation. So I, uh, I think we're done with our session, a little bit uh, postponed. So I'm hand handing back to my microphone to Professor Lee. Oh, thank you, thank you, uh, all of you. Thank you for the joining this first time the class, uh, the uh, webinar. Because uh, actually, I want to go to the, the Bali. You know, the Bali is a very nice uh, uh, area. I agree. So, I yeah, agree. I, I I miss I miss. Anyway. Uh, Thank you all of you, uh, the Bancha and Su and Jiang and Sanjay. I, I hope you enjoy our the webinar, the audience. So I think the good speaker, the good uh, moderator, uh, good audience. So next time, uh, this comment Limbate will be, uh, will prepare again for the, uh, our the, the Asian, the show the people. Thank you. The the safe safe stay until the coronavirus we should overcome in this uh, this period, and then we we'll use soon again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> so we have to say goodbye. If 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 any comment for the short speech, the pancha. Yeah, no. 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 I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. See you soon again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, all of you. Stay safe. Keep safe. Stay safe. Yeah. Stay yeah. More. Yeah. More. yeah. Thank you. Stay Thank safe. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah.